Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and we are delighted that you have tuned us in. You know, you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you. It's simple. All you have to do is send us an email, jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, today we have another lovely guest, yes, and her indeed. name is Jeannie Ewing, and she is the author of a book, From Grief to Grace, The Journey from Tragedy to Triumph. Amen. That's right. Like, how can that happen? How yeah. does that happen? Yeah. And there's enough grief in the world, just like from turning on the television today, right? All the people that are suffering in Central, Louisiana, yep. right? Central Europe, mm -hmm. terrible earthquake, over 150 people dead, so many people injured, people trying to rescue them. Grief, Indiana, tornadoes, Louisiana, floods, Afghanistan, an, an attack on a United States a university there. Grief, right. you know, sorrow, pain, and then the usual grief, just from human relationships, breakdown of relationships, some parents experiencing grief, sending their kids off to college or to school, and they're just saying they experience grief. What do you mean grief? Because they're experiencing change. Right. I'm never going to get this back again. This is changed. Divorce, infidelity, um, age. You know, it's, it's nothing like people meeting people from your high school years, and you know they're saying, looking at your picture, are you this person? Mm -hmm. You know, and you say, yeah, I'm that same person. I'm just sixty something years old now. Seventy, eighty. 90 years old now, and maybe there's grief. I'm never going to get that time back again. Um, but I think the term grief needs to be, so to speak, rehabilitated, because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a good word. On this side of heaven, there is sorrow, there is loss, and there is pain. Sometimes it's torturous, the grief that we go through when we lose somebody, somebody dies, or just loss in a variety of ways. But grief is right. right. It fits what's going on. And we need to understand it. We need to know how we're feeling, how we're feeling, and, and embrace that, mm -hmm. work through that, because grief wants to heal us. Right. And if we participate in working it out. Otherwise, you could stop, get stuck, and anesthetize your grief, drink it away, drug it away. Um, pretend that you know it's not going to happen. It's going to be okay. I'm not really yeah. feeling like this. Not make the adjustments that we need to make in life. Yeah. A simple case in point. Yeah. Today is our grandson's birthday. He's 13, yeah. right? Little Nate's three, 13. 13. So it's so my first grandson, the male. I have granddaughters that are older. I have them too. You have them too. <laughs> well, we get on the phone and we sing Nate Happy Birthday. You did. He's yeah. 13. Happy birthday. We start singing. I start crying. Yeah. yeah. What am I crying for? It's his 13th birthday. I had, to carry, I had to carry the song myself because you were crying. You had to carry the song. You're looking at me like, it's 10 to 7 in the morning. Why yeah, are you, you were crying? really crying. I was crying. I thought we were happy. <laughs> we yeah. were happy, but what happened was it was a passage. It was, it was a grief. It was just an instant moment of just saying, oh, he's growing up. It was that kindergarten <laughs> moment, you know, that we have as moms. It's like... You know that pain passage, and yeah. it's like teenage years and um, kindergarten, college, just the grief passage of life, yeah. normal things that you have to <clears throat> process so that when big moments happen, yeah. Yeah. you have to be ready for them. That's right. And <clears throat> uh, as I was saying, you know, I think grief gets a bad name, <laughs> although none of us really want to go through it. You're going to go through it. And I was thinking about one of our former guests, uh, Monsignor Bransfield. Yes. And he spoke about e even pain and grief and death should be clues to us, whether you're a believer or a non-believer. Well, what's the clue? That we're yearning for more. Mm -hmm. I mean, we say in, in these sorrows, catastrophes, evil and violence and infidelities and children, especially painful when, when they're sick or ill, why are we yearning for more? Why are we yearning for permanency? Why are we yearning for wholeness? And whether you're a believer or a non-believer, you have to ask yourself, where is that coming from? Mm -hmm. Because really, the sin and suffering and death was not part of God's original plan. There must be more. So listen to that yearning. And then our guest, Jeannie Ewing, is going to share with us, you can unite this to the suffering of Christ. Mm -hmm. And your sufferings can be transformed into love. And they can be changed into ministries, right. into apostolates. Mm -hmm. 
into reaching out for others. And I think this really undoes the evil work that Satan wants to do with grief and with death. And we can say, no, something glorious can happen in this life and in the age to come. Well, you know, in preparing for the show when it talked about turn suffering into love, like from the world's standpoint of view, it doesn't make sense. But from God's mm. standpoint of view, it makes perfect yeah, sense. Yeah. So if you want to turn your grief, you want to learn, how did, why do I turn my grief, my sadness, my sorrow into love and make it matter in this life and in the life hereafter, yeah. you want to stay tuned to our show. We have Jeannie Ewing. She is the author of a great book, From Grief to Grace, The Journey from Tragedy to Triumph. Amen. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you're an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you. If you have a question for our beautiful guest today, Jeannie Ewing, just give us a call during the live broadcast. Call us at 1-800-221-9460. Outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we will use your beautiful question right here on the air. Well, here she is, beautiful Jeannie, all the way from Indiana. And you come today to tell our family at home mm. the beautiful story from grief to grace that you lived yes. and that you wrote about. And now today you're going to get to tell about it. Mm. So Jeannie, we want to welcome you to At Home with Jim and Joy. And just tell us, tell our family at home a little bit about yourself and why you wrote this book. So I'm a cradle Catholic. And I thought when I was in my 20s that I was a pretty devout Catholic. I never really strayed from the church. I always went to mass on holy days and Sundays. I prayed my rosary, went to adoration, all those things. Mm -hmm. And when my husband and I got married nine years ago, I just really took my vows seriously and so did he. He's a very strong Catholic too. So we had no clue though that we would be living redemptive suffering, mm -hmm. this very important part of our Catholic faith. We had no idea. We, we gave it lip service, but it wasn't something that was real to us. So of course we said, yes, we will welcome children. And we had our daughter Felicity. And um, then a couple years later, I was pregnant again and enjoyed this pregnancy. I wasn't worried or anything like I was the first time. I had a very healthy, normal pregnancy and three ultrasounds that showed Sarah's development was fine. I did opt out of the genetic testing. Mm -hmm. And some people ask me, well, why did you do that? Well, there were a couple of reasons. One is that the only test that I was offered was the amniocentesis, which was very risky to my baby. And uh, my husband and I just said, no, not at all. We're not going to risk that. And the other reason was that he and I both agreed that regardless of what may or may not happen with her genetically, we would love her and raise her <clears throat> as long as God gave her to us. Mm -hmm. So that's why I opted out of it and went into the birth very blind. So I had a very normal and natural progression right. for labor and delivery and was really excited about that. And then all of a sudden, my heart rate and Sarah's heart rate went up really high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, my doctor, this was like maybe 24, 26 hours after I had started Yikes, labor. That's a long labor. It was very mm -hmm. long. And I was exhausted, of course, and I just wanted her to come out and be safe. <clears throat> well, my doctor said, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to do a C-section, which was at the time my most dreaded nightmare. Yeah. I'd never had any major surgeries or anything, but I thought, okay, if this is how she's gonna have to be born, then that's what's gonna happen. But in that moment, when th those words were delivered to me, I felt this black cloud descend upon my soul. It was like everything went dark. Wow. And I remember just, I started weeping. And of course, there's no shame when you're in the delivery room. <coughs> All these strangers are surrounding me, right? And my husband says, I can't imagine what you're going through. And I said, I wonder if this is how Jesus felt when he said, my God, my God, why have you mm -hmm. forsaken me? I'd never felt that way before, but I was so, I just felt so alone. And 
almost near despair, I would mm. say. And there was this tiny little voice inside of me. It was the Holy Spirit, it was my guardian angel, I don't know who, but I know it was from heaven. <clears throat> and said to me, say a prayer to Father Solanus Casey. Who is? Yes, so Father <laughs> Solanus Casey was a Capuchin priest and he is a venerable now. So he's on his, you know, on the road to canonization, not, yeah. not beatified yet. But anyway, he, he lived a very simple and a very holy life. Yeah. He actually spent a little bit of time in our diocese for a while. And many miracles were attributed to his intercession, even when he was alive. So I had learned about Father Solanus years before this moment when I was giving birth. And I really loved his story because he was so opposite of me. I'm kind of this perfectionist, this control freak, and um, he was just very resigned to God's will. Even very mundane or even menial tasks, he did with great joy. Wow. And I just really <clears throat> longed to be more that way. So in this moment, say a prayer to Father Solanus Casey, I just said this very quick, silent prayer, did not tell anybody not even my husband, mm -hmm. because they were wheeling me into the OR. And I just said, please, Father Solanus, help me, be with me. And I felt immediately washed over wow. with peace. It was that peace that surpasses all understanding. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. definitely with me. So I go in the OR and I just felt this, I felt God's presence. There was a holiness in this room. And the doctor that actually did my cesarean was not my family doctor. I'd never met her before this moment. And then, you know, she delivers Sarah and there's this silence that falls upon the room and I couldn't see what was happening, I didn't know. And my husband comes over and says, well, I need to take a look at Sarah. And then the pediatrician comes over, do you have genetic issues in your family? I'm so naive, I'm kind of drugged up, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, no, why would, why would there be? So she kind of sheepishly walks away and my husband comes over and he says, well, it looks like there might be something wrong with Sarah, but I think, I think we'll get through it, we'll be okay. And of course I start crying. I can't even hold her at this point. <clears throat> and so they wheel me back into the recovery room and they you know, cleaned up Sarah and weighed her and all those things. And the doctor that delivered Sarah came back to me and she just had this look of astonishment in her eyes. Yeah. And she said, I have to tell you, I'll never <clears throat> ever forget today. I will never forget delivering your daughter. I used to deliver babies in the Bronx. I've seen parents walk away from their children when something like this happens. I've seen husbands leave their wives. I've, so I've seen abandonment. And she said, the way that you and your husband embraced the situation, everybody in the OR today agreed that you must be Christians or in denial. Mm -hmm. You know, so we kind of chuckled a little bit. And by this time I was able to hold Sarah and see her for the first time. And I saw she had little mitten hands so her fingers were fused together, her toes were fused together, her eyes were kind of buggy and protruding, and her forehead was sticking out a lot, which is why she could not come out of the birth canal <clears> naturally. <throat> and I, I didn't know what, what, what this was, and I didn't know she was going to live or die, quite mm -hmm. honestly. And so this doctor said to me, I, I just have to tell you that your daughter is a child of God. She is a special daughter of God, and God has special plans for her and for your life. And she said, today was a miracle. When I delivered your daughter, first of all, it was a flawless C-section. She's like, it was just like a textbook. <clears throat> Nothing went wrong. She said, that never happens. Secondly, we all agreed that there was a divine presence in the room mm -hmm. with us. And she said, thirdly, when I reached my hand into your womb to deliver Sarah, I felt God's hand take over. He was the, it was his hand that delivered your baby. Now remember, this is a doctor yeah. who never met me, did mm. not know if I had a faith or anything, didn't know my story and didn't care. She mm. was very convicted, mm. very convicted with yeah. the Holy Spirit and very confident in what she said. Mm -hmm. And she just kept saying very, very strongly to me, don't worry, God has special, special plans for your daughter. Mm -hmm. So I attributed that to Father Solanus Casey's intercession. Yeah incredibly powerful and moving. You mentioned you were kind of a controlling, mm -hmm. perfectionistic person, mm -hmm. and now you're confronting a situation that you never thought you'd have. Everything was very normal in terms of your pregnancy and you're expecting a healthy child. Yes. This must seem like a dream to you, what's going on. Um, so what happened to you in the midst of this process in terms of receiving precious Sarah into your life. Um, how did you do that? Well, the first few days I was really enshrouded in grace. Yeah. It really wasn't me. I was not worried. 
I felt just this peace that had settled on my soul the moment that I said that prayer before the operation. And it hadn't lifted. I just felt this joy. I, I, my husband and I welcomed the mystery surrounding Sarah's mm -hmm. life. And we knew that we would have to deal with a life that we didn't really want or seek. But we also knew that she was God's daughter before she was ours. Let me just interrupt you for a minute. What's the name of the condition that so, she had? Yeah, so yeah. Sarah was not yet at this point diagnosed, okay. but it was speculated she had a rare genetic condition called Apert syndrome. And Apert syndrome is a form of craniosynostosis, which means that the bones in the skull are prematurely fused. And they also have the fused fingers and toes. So we knew that we were gonna deal with a lot of surgeries because mm -hmm. she's a baby and her skull is already fused together. It's gonna have to open up yeah. so her brain can grow. And so we knew at the very minimum she'd have to have her fingers separated and her, her head operated on. Right. So a lot to deal with. Yeah, right. How, how were you able to deal with it? Were you able to deal with it? What was your relationship with the Lord at this point? What was going on with you and your husband and, and family? Right, so we were, um, like I said, in the hospital. It was, I think I was still maybe in shock. Yeah. But also there, it was a very grace-filled time. And it wasn't until I came home and went back in my normal environment mm -hmm. when the fear settled upon my soul. Yeah. And that's when I realized, oh, my faith isn't as strong as I thought it was. I had all these questions come up that I had heard other people say, but I thought, I kind of scoffed at it, you know, in my pride, at, you know, gosh, they just don't have a strong faith. Of course, God's with them in their suffering. And of course, suffering has meaning. But I, in this these two weeks after we brought Sarah home, I was asking those questions. Right. I was wrestling with that. Mm -hmm. I was really angry. I had two good friends from our parish that had a baby within the same week that Sarah was born. And both of their <laughs> children were healthy and typical. Mm -hmm. And so I was really angry. I'm like, why did you choose Sarah and our family to have to go through this, Lord? Mm -hmm. I don't understand this. And so I was very... I guess humbled and humiliated in the sense that I was shocked that I was asking these questions that never had come up before right. and wrestling with my faith, really doubting, really doubting that maybe God really was all good and maybe he really was here in the mystery in the midst of suffering. And yeah. I really was doubting this, mm -hmm. not necessarily in despair, but <clears throat> very despondent, very dark place. And I didn't like that about myself. I didn't like being there, but I knew I had to be honest about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew there were other people that were in that place of grief. So I knew that whenever the opportunity came up to tell my story, that that would have to be a part of it so that people realize it's okay to be mad at God. It's just not okay to close the doors of communication to mm -hmm. him. Yeah. So I was still talking to God. I was you know, giving him yeah. some choice words, but I was still saying, I wanna hear from you. I wanna know what this is all about. Mm -hmm. And then something really profound happened to me. Again, it was divine grace. And it was maybe two weeks after this had happened and I was just a mess, just a wreck every day. And I was crying, crying myself to sleep. And I could feel myself kind of slipping into a place where this was gonna be permanent for me. Mm -hmm. This resentment, this bitterness, this restlessness yeah. in my soul. <clears throat> and I could feel it eating away at me, almost from the inside out like a cancer. And so the Lord just spoke very clearly and said, Jeannie, you have a choice to make. You can choose to continue down this path and you will become a victim of everything, a victim of circumstance. You will, you'll blame somebody or something for whatever bad happens or whatever perceived misfortune happens upon you. Or you can choose victory through the cross mm -hmm. and it's gonna be hard to carry your cross and you'll have to die to yourself but don't ever forget in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I, of course, being God, I needed to hear that. Mm -hmm. I needed that clarity is to show me, you can go this way and choose the path to perdition, or you can choose the really hard struggle and often lonely yeah. struggle of suffering, but knowing, confident, 100% certain that the resurrection is after yeah. all of yeah. that. That is really powerful <clears throat> because it is that we always do have those moments in our lives when we can choose life or we can choose death. You know, one is gonna bear an abundant fruit in our own lives, in the lives of our family, in your marriage, and now today in the lives of others, even in, as you authored and penned a book and to tell your story of that journey from grief to grace to say you can get from point A to point right. B, but it is a cross and, and is, you gotta work it, right? It is yeah. a choice. I think of the scripture where our Lord says, it's one thing for our Lord to say, I'm gonna die, 
I'm going to suffer, I'm going to go to the cross, they're going to kill me, so on, but I'll rise again. But then he says to us, if you want to follow me, yes. if you want to follow me, then deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. And then he always says, if. And sometimes he comes to his apostles and asks them two or three times in various situations. He'll ask you again. Into yes. the future, he'll ask me again. So it's a decision, isn't it? Yes. Which absolutely. way you want to go. So take us into your choice. You made that choice? I did. I just said, okay, mm -hmm. Lord, I say yes. I know you're, I, I appreciated his mercy in revealing to me that it was going to be a hard road. But that's how God is, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He's a loving father. And so he knew that I needed to know that. He's, I needed to know what I was getting myself into so that it was a truly free choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though the, the, the details of that journey were not specific, of course, that was still a mystery. That was where the trust came in. And so I just made a decision that moment. Really, it really was in mm -hmm. that moment. I'm going to change the way that I perceive this. And I know that God has a plan for this. I don't know what it is, but I want to say yes to him every day. And I also want to choose to enjoy today and yeah. to see how God is working in our life, in our family, in my marriage, in Sarah's life today, because I don't really, I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know, especially with Apert syndrome and the, it's so rare. There are no statistics about mortality rates or life expectancy. So I knew that every moment we had with Sarah was a precious gift. And I had to really treat my whole life that way. Mm -hmm. Or you would miss it. Yes. <laughs> you miss that moment. You miss that life. You miss that journey. Tell us about how it affected your marriage and mm. the good that came out of it. Because it is true. When, when you are in a critical situation like that, marriages, people leave. Couples leave. You know, it's like, oh, no, wait, this is too hard. I didn't bargain for this. Exactly. You know, so how did you and your husband maintain your sanity through all of this? I'm glad you asked that because... Statistics show that up to 80% of couples that have a medically fragile child end up divorced. 80%? And it doesn't, 80%. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't <clears throat> matter if they have a faith tradition or not. Right. So my husband and I knew that we really had to uh, put even more effort into our marriage mm -hmm. because men and women deal with grief differently. And that was something that he and I both talked about right away was his um, tendency to withdraw and not show emotion because he felt, you know, I'm the provider and the protector of the family. I have to be strong for everybody else and hold it together. And then my need to talk about it, talk it through and cry about it. And, and so we just discussed, wow, this is really different how we're dealing with this. And in that discussion, my husband said, well, maybe other men need to know mm -hmm. it's not a weakness to feel sorrow and to express that sorrow. So then he actually wrote something that became the appendix in my book, and it specifically addresses husbands and fathers and, and how they process grief and his own experience with that. Mm -hmm. So that's how it affected our marriage. Uh, and even now, you know, there are days where and weeks where we are exhausted because there's, there are a lot of doctor's appointments, lots of therapy, lots of surgeries and post-op appointments. And so sometimes it's really hard to connect when you feel your emotional reserve is totally depleted. And yet, um, I think really prayer keeps my husband and me together. We pray together. We pray as a family. And we also have a very strong individual prayer life. Mm -hmm. And so we just discipline ourselves every day mm -hmm. to make sure that we enter into that sacred space with the Lord. And we also try to do things that are fun together. Even if that just means when the girls go to bed, we sit down and have a glass of wine and just talk. Mm -hmm. And that seems so simple to some people, but to us, it's very rejuvenating yeah. to our marriage. It's necessary. Well, it's too. your emotional intimacy yes. and it's how you recharge. Yes. How, how does this experience <clears throat> of receiving Sarah and all that goes with her and your need for control now, you know you can't control um, how does that all fit with, why does it get the tag of grief? You know, how does that fit with the term grief? Why is this grief? Some people might just say, well, this is a terrible thing, you know, to, to have this happen, and you just got to deal with it. How does that get into grief? They might associate grief just with death. Right. Um, how is this grief? Very good question. So I didn't actually label it as grief either at <clears> first. <throat> After this, you know, incident where I chose to go down this path of suffering and my own personal Calvary, I decided, okay, I need to find out what God wants me to do with this. So I found this woman who lives in Long Island, and she's a very strong Catholic, and she has a daughter with a rare disease also, and she became my mentor, kind of a spiritual mentor to me. And she's very gifted charismatically. And so one day, 
<clears throat> maybe, I don't know, six months after we had started talking on a weekly basis, she said to me, I was praying for you and the word grief came to me and I think you should take that to prayer. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of taken aback at first because I thought, oh, does she think my life is just nothing mm -hmm. but sorrow and darkness and pain? <clears throat> and then, but I said to her, I will, and I did. And in the, the course of maybe a week or two, the Lord showed me these excerpts of my life that I knew to be kind of this revelation of this pattern over time that the Lord permitted me to experience different types of grief. It was a theme in my life. Mm -hmm. So growing up, um, there was mental illness in my family, addiction. Um, and then I actually ran a grief group for teenagers when I was an intern for school counseling. There, you know, So I was dealing with suicides and I was dealing right. with um, parents that had died from heart attacks and uh, kids at school that had children that died of SIDS. I mean, all kinds yeah, of issues. Yeah. And at the time, when I was a young grad student, I thought, why am I doing this? It was very unusual. Yeah. Even my supervisor said to me, we've never had this happen. This is very, very strange. And you happen to be the one, you're going to do it. But you know, all of these things are orchestrated by divine providence. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord revealed these things to me. And I realized that what my husband and I were going through was chronic grief. Because it's something, it's a cross, it never goes away. You know, every day to some degree or another, there, uh, there are immense sacrifices that we have to make to sleep or to our time, to all these extra things. You know, you have kids and, and there are normal things that you have, as a parent have to do to teach your child and raise them. And we have to do all those things and then above. Mm -hmm. So I realized that this was just a pervasive uh, presence in my life and it wasn't necessarily something that was a bad presence right. like you were talking about yeah. in the beginning the opening right. comments it's something that the Lord was showing me could actually be a gift mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. well, we're going to take a break <clears throat> at this point we're speaking with Jeannie Ewing author of From Grief to Grace The Journey from Tragedy to Triumph we want to hear from you we'll be right back please don't go away Welcome back. Well, remember, we want you to be a part of our show. And if you have a question for Jeannie, you just give us a call during the live broadcast. Call us at 1-800-221-9460. Outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we can use your question right here on the air. Well, now don't forget to order your copy of Mother Angelica's Answers, Not Promises, great book from Religious Catalog. This great book is full of mother's advice on a whole range of topics. And boy, she's a good Italian lady. She has lots of advice. She was a very wise woman, and you can always count on her for just the right answer to your most puzzling question. You can order Mother Angelica's Answers, Not Promises on your our to our website, EWTN.com, or calling 1-800-854-6316. It's item number 80046. Yeah. You know, Jeannie, you were sharing, even when you were getting on the plane <coughs> and your daughters were with you, tell our family at home what your daughter said oh, when, this she, is when so you're going on the plane. Oh, this is so sweet, yes. So I gave my daughters a kiss and said, um, I, was, you know, I was going to EWTN, Sarah, who's three now, she said, EWTN, I love Mother Angelica. Mm, and I said, I'm sweet. sure she's watching over you, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. No joke. Yeah. Well, so continue sweet. to unpack for us again your own personal experience, encounter, grief experience, and the writing of the book. So after my friend suggested I pray about this word grief, and I realized, oh, I guess there is a common theme, this thread in my life, then... <clears throat> My editor of Catholic Exchange, I had been blogging for them for a while, he emails me and says, have you ever thought of writing a book? Because the, the articles you write have this common thread of you know, understanding detachment or surrendering to God's will and his providence, holy darkness, all these things. He said they just seem to have this theme and it's really resonating with our readers. And so that's when I thought, oh, maybe it is a book. And I had been a writer my whole life, just not publicly or published. And so then my friend comes back, the one that had mentored me, and she said, 
Did you have a new word for you? Yes, she did. <laughs> she did, and she didn't know any of this was going on, and she said, okay, your book title is supposed to be From Grief to Grace. Mm. So I just, I asked my editor, I said, what do I do? He said, well, go ahead and send you know, a sample chapter to yeah. Sophia, and yeah. I did. I told, yeah. and I know, I understood at this point yeah. that getting a publishing contract the first time is almost impossible. It's almost unheard of, especially with a major <laughs> publishing company. And I just said, Lord, this is this is your work. Whatever you want to happen, if it doesn't get accepted here, whatever, wherever you want it to go, I, I just yeah. follow your lead. And they did. Like two weeks later, they said, we want to take your book. Mm -hmm. So I knew it was the Lord because I, here I was this unknown, you know, fledgling writer, and they saw that potential. Mm -hmm. Great. What <laughs> forms does grief take? You know, how do people identify grief in their own lives? For me, I think of grief, the, the key with grief is loss mm -hmm. for me. And there's all kinds of losses for all kinds of people in all kinds of situations at all different stages and phases of life. If you're experiencing loss, it's like an earthquake in your life. The magnitude of it could vary, but sure. is that along the lines that grief can come in various forms in various circumstances, situations? That's probably one of the most succinct definitions I've ever heard from anybody because most He's people... He's so smart. Yeah, I, I, yeah <laughs> that's what it is. Most people say they just associate grief with death. And I right. think that's what our culture does. We just automatically think, okay, when, when someone dies, we expect a period of bereavement. We expect to go through these rites and rituals and funerals and viewings and everything, burial. But we don't really think about maybe the mystical deaths in life, that we have to bury a dream, mm. a dream. like yeah. we had for our children. You know, it was, it was really, for us, it was more like this idea that we had of who Sarah, right. we thought Sarah would be mm -hmm. and grow up to be. And we had to bury that that yeah. hope and that dream. Yeah. So it could be losing a job, it could be losing a home. Like think of all these people mm -hmm. devastated right. by the earthquakes and the floods and the tornadoes. Mm -hmm. That is grief. That that void that you feel when there is a loss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That sadness, that sorrow. Yes. You know, and and you, need, you need to process and work through that. We look at the <clears> culture <throat> that we live in and we look at our various countries we look at Jesus looking at Jerusalem, and he said, how many times would I have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her brood? All I want to do is take you into myself, but you wouldn't. And that, that, that's a grief. And he says he wept. Yeah. And so the loss is so much that could be, but you keep messing it up. And we want to take control, especially raising kids or whatever we're doing. And say, hey, this could be so much easier, but there's free will. And, and look at our country. Yeah. You know, and, and the changing of, of our laws. Yeah. You can't change reality. You know, marriage, family, life, and you're promoting death right. and rejection. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it's okay to weep, you know, over our, over our country. We should have a grief. Why? Because we're losing so much. We could be so much more. And we should weep as Jesus weeps. And then that does what? If we weep for others, because in reading your book and, and reading your materials, and I was really struck by not only is grief healthy, because you have to go through it, but you're saying it could be transformed. Yes. It becomes an apostle. It yes. becomes a ministry. It turns into love. How is that? Well, grief, spiritually speaking, is a form of poverty. It's a poverty of spirit. Huh. So when we get to a place in our sense of loss, it's an emptying of all the extra things, the forms of escapism, the forms of control and pride. There's really an emptying that's necessary. And when that happens, and we weep for the world or um, a social sin of some sort or maybe a personal intention, that's where the Lord can enter in if we permit it. We mm -hmm. ask him to enter into that. And that's when lives are changed because this can really become a form of intercessory prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are people out there that have very hidden lives and prayer is their means of converting our nation. Mm -hmm. And they are weeping for the condition of our world and the fact that, you know, you have the death with dignity groups that are right. promoting the, the euthanasia. And you've got, um, you know, of course, the, the abortion issues and all the artificial means of obtaining conception, right? And so these people are praying for the, these social situations, these social sins to change. And that's part of grief when we don't just let it kind of become stagnant and just sit there right. and fester. But when we actually say, Lord, do something with this enter into my wound and make it 
heal somebody else, right. yeah. bring life to somebody right. else. So Make it beautiful yes, so yes. that it matters, so that your suffering isn't just for suffering's sake, that your suffering is redemptive, that not only in the interior of your own soul, but in your marriage, yes. in Sarah's life, yeah. you're her only mommy. Ain't no other mommy coming. Yeah. It's you, and you want to be the best one. Um, you know, and like you said, you have to you have to bury dreams so that she can live who she is, whoever God made her to be. Yes. You know, which is so important. Yeah. We're going to go straight to an email. It says our <clears throat> culture abhors the thought of suffering, a slight headache, and we immediately grab some aspirin. How do you show someone the value of suffering? When the culture says we need to take a pill for everything and anything that ails us. And this is Donna from Kentucky. Well, I think that it kind of goes back to this cliche, me being a cradle Catholic, where I, I was raised hearing, offer it up, offer it up. And when I was a kid, I hated hearing that. But there is such merit to that. Mm -hmm. So it can be, I think there was something in the homily this morning at Mass, and it made me think of this quote from a saint that I can't recall now, but the path to heaven is paved with small crosses. Mm -hmm. So these headaches, okay, instead of, I mean, sometimes we need to take medicine. I'm not advocating against that. But for every little thing is our automatic response to, to hit the bottle or get a pill or to get on a video game or an internet game or something or social media. No, we should be using these or allowing God to use these as opportunities for sanctification, ours mm -hmm. or somebody else's. Yeah. So it could be a simple <laughs> prayer, like we have a headache, and we can just silently offer that headache as a form of prayer, as an offering, a gift to yeah. the Lord. Or it could be something huge, like a life filled with, you know, um, medical bills or, you know, somebody that's going through cancer or something like that, or someone that's caring for someone with Alzheimer's. Those are the, way, those are the little crosses that all add up to the resurrection for mm -hmm. us. Yeah seems indeed it is the way of our Lord. I continue to think of that weeping over Jerusalem and then his uniting himself with that and with the people and finally himself. What are you going to do about this? I'm going to, I'm going to die to myself and I'm going to enter into this and I'm going to bear this. And that's redemptive. So you're saying that in his incredible singular redemptive act, we can unite other sufferings to that suffering. It's what St. Paul says, I want to make up what's lacking in the sufferings yes. of Christ. Yeah. You're just kind of like, well, what's lacking in the sufferings of right. Christ? But whatever that means, it's, it's there. So we unite and Jesus, in a sense, isn't here on earth physically. He's in the tabernacles, but he's present with me. So I can make up a lack. I'm really here now and there's suffering and I'm suffering and I unite it to him. Something really happens. You believe something really happens in other people and in nations and in situations I do mm -hmm. I do I mm -hmm. absolutely do I'm very I mean why else would we pray and there are so many different forms of prayer well lamentations is one form of prayer right mm -hmm. so and that's to me that's why the Psalms are so beautiful because mm -hmm. they're filled with lamentations yeah. they're very real and honest about the suffering yeah. of the psalmist yeah. however they always end in this hope and this confidence this expectant faith yeah. mm -hmm. I know and I trust in God's mercy and yeah. his providence and his love you, know, you shared earlier on just about your own experience and that you really struggled with your faith and you mentioned the Psalms and Lamentations and Jeremiah, and I don't know where the verse is, but I love that verse that says, you know, Lord, you told me to drink this, and I drank it, and it was sweet, but then when it went down, it was really bad. You tricked me. Yes, mm -hmm. that's Jeremiah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, is it? Yeah. I was testing He said, you, you duped me. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. duped me. You yeah. tricked me. Yeah. And we want people to know that, you know, you don't want to stay stuck there. You don't want to have a faith of abuse with a little bit. God can take it. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and we're trying to figure out, you know, what's going on here. And as we said earlier, that there is a yearning. Yeah. There's something in us, whether we're believers or non-believers, that says, you know, this is really bad. Now, God's going to turn it to good, right. but it's got to be both. It's a burden and a blessing, right. as you mm -hmm. say. And you, it's a burden, it's a blessing. Uh, it's both of those things. And that's sanity. If we don't get both of those things on this side, then we're super spiritual. We're denying what's going on. We become Christian scientists. I, I think that like pain is like kind of just like a figure yeah. of our imagination. Yeah. So you got to do both, and God can take that and that's, that's experiencing eternal life, yes. you know, a new quality of life here and entering into Christ's sufferings and things happen. You list a number of principles mm -hmm. that are very important as you go through grief and suffering and pain and agony, you know, various situations. What are some of the keys that you've isolated you know, in the church teaching or mm -hmm. in saints that can help us along the way? 
Well, there are six of them that I list in my book, and I'll just tell you, my favorite has to be Holy Darkness. St. John of the Cross is a saint that I was introduced to before I ever had children. My spiritual director just suggested that I read the collected mm -hmm. works of St. John of the Cross. And I did. I read the whole thing. And I thought, wow, this is timeless because, mm -hmm. you know, we're living, he, you know, St. John of the Cross wrote this hundreds of years ago, but this is truth that exists throughout eternity. Mm -hmm. And I thought this needs to be something that is accessible to the modern person because, you know, with the mystical language, it can be kind of hard to decipher. <clears throat> so one of the things that I try to say in my book is not all darkness is bad. And this is, of course, related to that concept of suffering. Not all suffering or grief is bad. And yet, you know, we're, we're so bombarded and inundated with the societal message that darkness is evil or darkness is punishment or darkness means God doesn't exist mm -hmm. or he doesn't care. He's not a benevolent God. Yeah. All these rationales that the world gives us, right, that we might be tempted to believe. I was tempted to believe those things. And what was so refreshing about St. John of the Cross was that I realized, no, there's an unholy darkness that exists because of sin. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there are choices that I make and then I receive the consequence of that. And that's an unholy darkness if I'm not living in a state of grace, right? Yeah. But there is also a beautiful holy darkness where maybe the Lord kind of draws us into this place spiritually in our interior lives where we no longer receive consolations or comforts or signs. Yeah. We don't have necessarily hear his voice or feel him, mm -hmm. but he's, he's beckoning us to love him more deeply, love him for the sake of the fact that he deserves to be loved and no other reason, not because he gives us something, not because he gives us, you know, some kind of comfort or consolation, but just because of who he is, because he's God and he deserves to be loved. Yes. And so that I think is important when we're talking about grief because grief can be a very dark place and people might feel as I did when Sarah was born, they might feel forsaken. They might feel like, you know, this dark cloud yeah. descended and all was lost for yeah. a time. Mm -hmm. And to know that that's not really what's happening. If mm -hmm. as long as they're being faithful and they're, they're um, staying true to their prayer life and staying close to the sacraments and they're in the state of grace and you're still experiencing this darkness, right. well, that's probably a holy darkness. Mm -hmm. That's probably mm -hmm. not a result of, you know, you're living this really yeah. evil, dark yeah. lifestyle. Well, so. That's good. Well, we have Dennis on the <laughs> phone. Dennis, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Jeannie. Yes. Uh, hi, Jeannie. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, has Sarah exceeded, like, the limits that other, you know, quote, professionals have placed upon her? Like, were you told to set your expectations for her abilities very low, and has she been able to do more than what people have said that she would ever be able to do? I have special needs children, and we have experienced that, mm -hmm. and our children have totally exceeded their curve, so to speak. Mm. Thank you so much for your call, and God bless you and your precious family. That's a really good question, yeah. Dennis. Well, I would say yes, as just a short answer to that, because when Sarah was born, we were given this copy from a very old medical textbook, and it, it listed all of the things that would go wrong with her body. And I'm talking every system in the body, the skin, her vision, her hearing, um, her cognitive ability or potential, um, limitations with cardiovascular functioning, pulmonary issues, on and on and on, Gast gastrointestinal. And you know, everywhere we go, she has about a dozen specialists, and some are occupational physical therapists, surgeons, other specialists. And everywhere we go, these specialists just marvel and say, mm. we have seen a lot of kids with Apert syndrome, and we have never seen any that are thriving like Sarah. So yeah, we, we believe, my husband and I believe that Sarah is just this living icon of, of Christ. She, she just is a witness by virtue of who she is because she looks different. People know that she has a disability, but when they encounter her, they encounter the Lord because mm -hmm. she is just so filled with joy and because also because she's exceeding what the professionals in the medical community expected for her. Right. Yeah. She's a treasure and a miracle. Yes. What's another one of the principles? You <clears> talked <throat> about the dark night. It's so important to be able to distinguish. Um, but I think we need to go to a break. So... We'll get to that when we come back. Don't go away. More on From Grief to Grace. Don't go away.
Welcome back. Well, we want to tell you about a very special event that is coming up. It's the EWTN Family Celebration on September 17th and 18th, and it's free. Operative word, free. So come on down to Birmingham, Alabama, and help us to celebrate the life and the legacy of Mother Angelica. Meet some of your favorite EWTN hosts like Marcus Grodi, Raymond Arroyo, and Jonette will be there. We will be there. That'll us, be fun. Yeah. Your kids can have fun with the Donut Man. You can shop at the special religious catalog that will be set up. It will be wonderful. And you can even attend Mass celebrated by Bishop Baker, the bishop here in Birmingham, Alabama. He will celebrate Mass for us on Sunday. You can get all the information on this year's <laughs> EWTN Family Celebration by going to EWTN.com and clicking on Family Celebration link. Don't forget, it's the EWTN Family Celebration on September 17th and 18th right here in Birmingham, Alabama. We would love to see you and have you. Well, right now we're going to go straight to Rome to hear from Joan and the update and what she has for us today. Joan? Well, greetings from Rome to all of you at home. And it's very obvious that my focus today has to be on the apocalyptic earthquake that struck central Italy yesterday morning, very early in the morning, August 24th. And it has turned towns, three villages, countless hamlets into absolute piles of rubble. Up to this point, about 247 people have been killed. They're still searching for others. Now, these hilltop towns, they were beautiful, they were old, they were historic. And some of them d date to medieval times. It is such a huge tragedy. And I've been posting about this on my blog, Jones Roman, on Facebook, and bringing you updates as often as I can. I was awakened by the tremor here in Rome at 3.35 in the morning by my, by my bed shaking. Now, I'm sure words fail me in describing the damage, and hopefully you have seen a lot of the horrific uh, pictures on television. Now, interestingly enough, Wednesday, Pope Francis decided not to hold a catechesis in his general audience, but instead he prayed the rosary, the sorrowful mysteries, with the faithful. And here's what he said. I had prepared the catechesis for today, as for all Wednesdays during this year of mercy, focusing on the closeness of Jesus. However, he said, on hearing the news of the earthquake that has struck central Italy, devastated entire areas and left many dead and wounded, I cannot fail to express my heartfelt sorrow and spiritual closeness to all those in the afflicted zones. He expressed his condolences to, to all those who had, of course, lost loved ones. And he said, I offer spiritual support to those who are anxious and afraid. And he added, when the mayor of Amatrice said the town no longer exists and also that there were many children who died, I felt deeply saddened, said the Pope. Now, <clears throat> we learned Wednesday afternoon that Pope Francis sent six members of the Vatican's fire department to help in rescue operations and cleaning up, if possible, the rubble. And um, by the way, we have yet to wait news on a hotel, the Hotel Roma in Amatrice. Um, Seventy people were said to be lodged there. Many are believed to still be buried. The interesting thing about this hotel is that the town is um, Amatrice, and the hotel became famous for the pasta, spaghetti amatriciana. Now, interestingly enough, the um, others affected by this were the Benedictine monks of Norcia. Norcia, as you know, is famous because it is the birthplace of St. Benedict and Scholastica. And there, among a, a lot of damaged buildings, was the Basilica. Now, the monks have moved to Rome. They did this yesterday. They're staying with the Benedictine, Benedictines of Sant'Anselmo, and I, I will keep giving you updates on that. Italian crisis, uh, excuse me, Italian caritas also hopped into action at the crisis, as did the Catholic Church in the country. And we had Bishop Giovanni Dercole of Ascoli Piceno, who was on the scene, hoped to be able to bless the dead, help in the burying. And the Italian Episcopal Conference has asked all the parishes of Italy to donate material and financial support. So a huge tragedy, folks. But you know what? Keep up your prayers. We need those, too. So thanks for the extra time today. But time's up. So back to you at home. 
Joan, thank you for that good and difficult report. We are all united together in prayer before our Lord and Our Lady. Well, Jeannie, tell us the resources you have available, how people can get to you and move from grief to grace or help others. Um, I have a website from grief number two grace.com. This is a fairly new website and it it's intended and its purpose is to be a Catholic grief resource. So a place where Catholics can go and find um, videos, podcasts, other books that I personally have read and, rec and recommend. And so that's what that website is all about. Okay. And then I have another website, lovealonecreates.com and that's mainly where I post updates about Sarah and just really neat stories about her, kind of like we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, which she said about EWTN. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just interesting things that happen in her development that I hope is an encouragement and helps maybe revive people's faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having Wonderful me. job today. And we want to say to you that the Lord leads the blind in right pathways, that he could take darkness and turn it into light. He'll take a crooked way and make it straight. He says, I'll never leave you. God bless you and all of your loved ones. Bye now. Thank you.